<laughs> District 46, if you would like to make your presentation at this moment. So if you would like to hold the microphone. Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for having us. Uh, we're excited to be here. We're excited for this potential project. Um, I brought with me, as well, first of all, my name is Chris Bobeck. I'm the Assistant Superintendent over at Grace Lake 46. Standing behind me is Kirk Hintz. He is from Performance Services. Uh, they will be doing the lead on the project. We also have Tom Hill from Erickson Engineering and Ellen Burrell from, she is the Superintendent of District 46. You're going to have to hold the microphone closer. closer. It's on. It is you on. just have Pretend to. it's a big auditorium. <laughs> All right. Um, there you go. We are basically here. Uh, you, you laid it out very nicely for us. We, there's a tax amendment that needs to take place, and also we have the request for a special use permit. Uh, what we want to do is we want to, first of all, give you a little bit of background about the project and about the company doing the project. They just happen to be the same company taking the lead that did the uh, District 127 uh, over at the High Ridge Lake High School. They did a roof mount and a ground mount for them. So it's a company that's familiar with solar power and familiar with going ahead and handling all of the issues that might come up uh, in terms of the construction and the timing and all of that stuff. Uh, we also know that there is uh, some questions from the engineer. We would be happy to address those questions or apply. Uh, we're here to kind of go back and forth and talk about uh, those issues that have come up and what we're going to do to address them. Uh, and uh, basically, uh, it, it's, we want to have an open dialogue with the board, and we want to make sure that we give you all the information that you need, as well as uh, you know, present a little bit ourselves that uh, we hope is informative for you. Okay, Chris, so, what we'll probably do is allow the district to uh, make their statements, even the concerns you have about the engineering letter, and then when we testify, or we'll have uh, Mr. Groom respond to those, and then we can have back and forth as Perfect. necessary. Perfect. Okay, so we'll start it off and uh, next we'll continue on with Kurt. Uh, he's going to go ahead and he's going to hand out a uh, presentation for you guys. You can look through while he goes through. We'll try to make it. Uh, uh, go through every page every yeah, we'll make it as efficient as possible. If you have any questions or concerns, obviously, when the dialogue happens, and we'll feel free to ask questions. I'm just going to show this. Their own power, the, the rates could go up 
at the rate at which they're producing solar would go up as well. So they're not going to see the same effects that somebody that doesn't have solar on would. So when we say it locks in the rate, that's what we're talking about. It really is going to help them uh, achieve some financial uh, freedom. Um, benefits is obviously uh, the panels themselves are uh, warranty for 25 years with an 80% production warranty. So that means 25 years from now, they should be producing at least 85%. Technology hasn't changed for the last 50, 60, 70 years. Panels are still producing. It, uh, the crystalline panel is still the same thing everybody uses. What's gotten better is obviously the technology with the wattages that continues to grow, and obviously the installation costs have come way down along with manufacturing costs overseas and, and different things like that. That has really changed the market. What has made it so prevalent and so positive and so um, popular in Illinois is they implemented an SREC market is called the Solar Renewable Energy Credit. And basically, you pay at home, you pay at the village, they obviously pay on a monthly basis a renewable fee. It's on everyone's utility bill. And no one's been able to capture that. But the IPA, which is the Illinois Power Agency, has um, put together through the Renewable Portfolio Standard, a lot of different acronyms, sorry, um, a, a program that's basically mandated to offset some costs and help uh, the district with uh, future payments. So they're going to be getting a 15-year contract being front-loaded with payments all in five years at a rate that has been determined by the IPA, which is a, a bonus. So not only are they going to be produ uh, producing their own solar and have an energy savings, they're going to have a demand savings because the highest demand peak day for them is going to change. and It won't be the most expensive day. It will shift to another day that's not as expensive. Along with the SREC income, that's how we're able to make money on, um, on an annual basis. Our process is uh, lengthy. We're an engineering based company, so we're conservative to begin with, but we obviously have a lot of uh, due diligence between going through um, the site, especially with the ground mount. We have um, we've hired uh, Erickson Engineering to be our civil to make sure that the we're in the proper area, proper zone, we're out of the floodplains, out of floodways. We're going to be putting fencing up, uh, all the different things that go into it. The design phase between a racking manufacturer and the civil engineer takes some time. And that's the phase we're in now along with getting permitting through, uh, through the different villages. Um, there's a, a site assessment, there's site approval. We have been contracted by the district pending um, these reviews and, and, and the positive outcome. To see. Um, there's a commissioning piece after installation where we're going to continue to come back. It's electronics, so there's not a lot of moving parts, but it is uh, it is going to take some tweaking, and we do have uh, you know inverters that um, uh, we'll be monitoring on a daily basis to make sure that they're that they're working properly. When we do an installation, we do multiple inverters. Now, uh, what that means is if something were to happen to one inverter. Uh, the system would still run and produce solar and you wouldn't be down. You would maybe lose one inverter with uh, a string of 10 or 15 panels or 20, how many are on it. Um, when you do a, a single inverter system, that's when you can get in trouble if something goes bad. The whole system is down, so that's why you're doing multiple inverters. Um, but we will be commissioning that. There's an interconnection with ComEd, uh, so tying that back in uh, and making sure they're getting the credits. And then um, we monitor it and stay on, on top of it. Help them with their uh, SRAC payments. Sounds like oversized Christmas lights. One goes out, they could all go out. Except okay. with their multiple inverters, one string goes out, one string goes out. We might lose a couple. It's very, it doesn't happen often, but um, it would be a lot, a lot easier than having to replace all string. And this way, honestly, we're going to be able to tell which one it is. I know when these Christmas lights go out, you don't know which one went bad, and you can trace it throughout the whole thing. So, um, I mentioned there's roof mount possibilities. In this case, we're looking at a ground mount. We'll be pile, uh, screw driving and pile driving the, uh, the, uh, the pillars so there'll be no disruption to, um, to the land. The vegetation will continue to grow. Um, it will obviously slow the vegetation down, but it will, st it will still grow, and that's obviously a positive uh, to keep up uh, with where we're at. The uh, <clears throat> Civil engineer has obviously looked at the property, and I'm going to let him talk in a second. He'll show you exactly where it's going to go and what his analysis was. But um, just to make sure that we've looked at 
all the best possibilities of putting as much solar in as we can fit in the area that was, uh, that was provided. There's a STEM opportunity where the district can use this as a learning tool for students. Um, we've teamed with the national organization that we'll, we'll put them in contact with and they can do some, some really cool solar uh, credits. And there's live monitoring and feeds in order to get access to see what those inverters are producing on a daily basis. Uh, really uh, creative things. I mentioned before we're conservative, so our calculations are conservative. We take 60 years of historical weather data in this area, and so uh, we've taken into account all the possible negative effects of solar. This environment, actually the Midwest and uh, northern Midwest, is a wonderful environment for solar. A misnomer is that, you know, <clears throat> this isn't the right environment. The fact is, the, the way the uh, the electrons and the proton and neutron, the way the science of the, of the solar works, it actually produces at a higher rate. We don't get as many sunny days as you would out west or down south, but if you compare a sunny day there and a sunny day here, same conditions, we're going to produce more based on how, uh, how free flowing things are. So um, this is a very good environment. If we got more sunny days, it would be even better, but um, we've seen a lot of success. We've derated the panels to begin with, again, for shading and soiling and any issues that might come up. There is inverter loss, there's line loss. Obviously, we have to run uh, and bore back to the building. So between where the panels are going to be and where the inverters and the stations, we have to get it back to the power source. And there's going to be a little bit of a loss there. We've taken all that into account in our, uh, in our projections. Uh, again, we're going to monitor this. And the key is that they're going to be making money uh, on an annual basis. It's hard to see, but that is what that solar calculation sheet is. The district's uh, consuming about, uh, let's call it round number, 750,000 AW at the, uh, at the Prairie View School. We're actually able to put in almost uh, 800,000 KW. Now, Illinois allows for um, us to go a little bit above, and we can add and get that to another building. So the other buildings aren't producing at 100%. Even though very few will be producing a little bit more than 100%, we can we can take the excess and put it towards one of the other buildings. And so um, they should they will always have a utility bill, but they will not be paying electrical costs at very few if everything goes the way planned. Uh, there's energy savings I mentioned is about fifty-two thousand dollars. Demand savings another six. SREC income is again. 15-year term front-loaded for the first five years, and that is uh, an additional almost $110,000. So the district is, is going to be positive um, over $165,000 in year one. Uh, now they will have a payment, and, and they'll work out the, the financing, but ultimately they're going to be making money on the system. And when you look at all four buildings as a whole, it's a wonderful Again, pile, uh, we're going to pile drive to reduce any environmental impact. It's not going to need soil, and we're not going to have to remove anything. Um, it's very low reflective glass. It's not going to harm any of the wildlife. Um, there's basically no moving parts, so there's really no O&M needed. Uh, if we get a huge snow, someone might have to go out there with a broom and just uh, sweep it off. But once the black glass heats up, it usually melts away. Uh, there just because it's warmer than what the, the air temperature would be. And uh, obviously, again, we're going to be monitoring that along with, uh, with their staff. I put a picture of what the uh, ground mount looks like. That's actually uh, high school's installation. Uh, the next page would be where we're projecting to put the brand new um, design location. I have a picture of a ground mount here with. Uh, what the actual racking looks like, and uh, it's going to be under 15 feet. It typically sits about uh, four or five feet off the ground. Uh, again, we were going to be uh, matching and, and looking at all codes and, and making sure that there's some options that we have. Um, and then our plan is to put a fence up, which again, Tom's going to talk about in a second. Um, and a couple more pictures that show you what the ground uh, racking looks like. Just went really quick and gave you a lot of information. So I'm sure you're going to have questions. But before that, I'd like to have Tom show you where we're uh, going to focus. Okay. Okay. Uh, I have 
uh, we have a topographic survey as the prime for part of the site. I've got about 80% of it from my surveyor. We have an updated sketcher. I'd like to hand one of these out to each of you. And then if you guys through the highlights. You will have to use the mic because we record the meeting. Certainly your voice carries the mic and serve it's better. My name is Tom Hill. I am the project civil engineer and I'm the technical director at Erickson Engineering. We are a civil engineering firm, land development firm with offices in Grace Lake, Chicago, Mokina, and we are in southern Indiana as well. But Grace Lake is our home office. And I am a Grace Lake resident and living north next to Grace Lake North High School, where we just put in a solar field. There's been so much buzz in our community about this. People are really proud to see this sort of thing happening in their town. They're proud to see this sort of thing happening with their school. And as a former Prairie View parent, I sent two kids through the school. I think you guys are going to be very proud and think people will be excited to see this at the site as well. We are attempting to optimize and fit as much, as many panels as we can at the southeast corner of our site. We are in zone to be one. We are abutting a B1 property, the railroad tracks, and, a, and uh, the agricultural district to the south. We do not abut any residents. We do not have any homes that will look at these panels in their backyards. And part, because of that, we think that this is a really good location <coughs> to put this sort of system. A couple of the challenges that we have back in this area is that there is a wetland and there is a floodplain. We have delineated the wetland, and our schematic design here is updated to reflect that boundary, and we are not going to be doing any work within that wetland. Now, the installation of these solar panels does not involve tearing up the ground. Uh, it's, it's kind of an odd process. We don't see a lot of these, a lot of towns haven't seen these yet, and you know, it's, it's sort of a new thing that's been coming into our area. But these, uh, the posts that these rack systems are mounted on are driven into the ground. So there is no real disturbance. Uh, nevertheless, we are showing a double row of silt fence protection along the wetland, as we typically do, although that will be serving more of a function of keeping the, the contractors and their vehicles out of the wetland more than anything else. We're not anticipating a lot of sediment laden runoff being generated from this sort of a disturbance to the ground. There is a floodplain here and that floodplain has a, we have a maximum depth on our system. This is based on Lake County's study of the area. It's not mapped per FEMA standards, but they mapped it on the Squaw Creek uh, study a number of years back. And based off of that, we have an elevation of approximately uh, 790.52. And not, not, not approximately exactly that. So we are installing panels over an area such that the lowest elevation is about three feet below that. So the maximum standing water we'll have in this field area is about three feet. The panels are going to be picked up above that. I'm not sure exactly what that ultimate height is going to be, but we're also looking at the spill across 120 as well as another sort of fail-safe there just in case the water gets even higher. Because we all know what we saw this July. Um, for us civil engineers, it's pretty spectacular for everybody else. You know, it was a brave inconvenience. We are Looking at a couple of options as far as safety goes around this fence. We originally were talking about a fence around the entire perimeter. Now that we've got the topo and we've gone out there and looked at this, we're thinking that we're probably just, as an option, we are looking at a chain link fence across the north side of the area from the existing detention basin all the way over and then probably a hedgerow. Uh, think prickly thorny bushes, something that nobody's ever going to want to try to get through. The back side in the, uh, the, south, sorry, the southeastern corner would be open, but that's open to a wetland slash floodplain area, and it's also open to the railroad tracks. So we're not anticipating any sorts of acts of vandalism or damage to our property from that respect. There is um, a Greg has issued a review letter, done a preliminary review on the project, and has a number of comments. 
I think one of the things that we would like to do, because this is such an unusual kind of project, this is not normal ground disturbance, it's not normal development or even structure placement uh, per the, the regulations, we would request that for the, for the purposes of the special use permit, that the condition be added that the school district, that this project be approved, subject to the school district following all other requirements as are legally, um, that they're legally obligated to follow. Um, and we press that and said this for the entire letter because there are some watershed development comments in there and we sort of don't want to open maybe that conversation or permit process beyond what we think the true uh, standards are that we're going to be held to. Let me interrupt a second yes, sir. just to I can just word. Um, you, you have seen in your packet Greg's letter and conditions and we were, I was set to recommend this evening that we accept, accept this as one member of the zoning commission that we accept their proposal. Once <coughs> Greg's letter, the, the parts of Greg's letters were completed appropriately. We do have time, and we may allow the engineers after the presentation and Jim Rock to go talk about is there any give and take, or is there another way for us to work it still to complete this, the project tonight uh, and approve it at the board meeting? You know, that's how the board sort of decides. Uh, but we'll have time between the meeting if we're amenable, if the, these three gentlemen can work out an agreement, and then that would be in the motion to us um, in the board meeting. Greg will have a chance to talk to that as well this gentleman to share the concerns, and we may have a little give and take here. But I just wanted to give you that background. Can I ask a question as long as you brought it up? Why don't we, just a quick question. Are we saying that the, the uh, eight conditions in this letter from Robinson have not yet been addressed and so what we're essentially saying we would approve this subject to the clearance of these eight provisions? Correct. Okay. I'm sorry for interrupting. Please go ahead. Oh, you're fine. Um, and I, that's basically what we've got here. Again, the heights of these panels, I believe the maximum height for an accessory structure I think was 10 foot or so. You know, we expect to be under that. We only have three feet of ponding out here. I believe there's another 18 inches or so until the road spills. But we're going to be building everything above that floodplain elevation. The conduits and everything are going to be waterproof. They're going to be rated for that. And the panels themselves will be set up high enough so that we can function in this floodplain area. And this is uh, very similar to the project over at Graves Lake North, which is also in a floodplain. And very similar to what we're also going through at Frederick. And we're seeing more and more of these happening nationally at VA sites, sometimes put in detention basins. Uh, people are finding that to be a productive sort of co-use of those areas, that they also provide that stormwater management, water quality benefits, but are also providing a source of green and renewable power. Any questions at this point prior to the village's testimony from the board? Um, I know that uh, one of the things that you were doing, you did the one in the high school, and they have a wooden fence around there, but I had the decision to go with the chain link rather than the wooden one here. The wood was put up uh, at a request uh, because of the neighbors, because there are homes uh, surrounding it. Um, <clears throat> we have uh, two thirds of that is a chain link fence. But the only areas that you can see from the homes are, are the wood, uh, the nicer wood fence. We're doing the, the same thing at the Frederick campus where we're putting up um, a wood fence where the homes are and it'll be chain link uh, the rest of the way. It will not have a top ring, so the, the fence will be, could be almost impossible, if really impossible to climb. How tall of a fence are you climbing? Uh, eight to ten feet, depending on, you know, we, the guy, I think Grace Lakes is an eight foot fence. Square size in it? I think it's an eight, eight, eight to ten. It'll, it'll have to depend on the code. Yeah, we will add up so we'll match all the time. Yeah, we'll match all the time. For the superintendent and Chris, <coughs> I, I spent 32 years in public education, and I understand that no matter what you build, if you build it, they will come. The kids will get there on their own, some way, somehow. I'm not saying that it needs to be surrounded, but 
All right, any other questions from yes. the board? Yes. Go, Jan. Um, you're saying that the school district is going to make money. Are you sure you're not saying save money? Is it, I mean, otherwise, how are they going to make money on this deal? Yes. Um, they are definitely going to be saving money, absolutely. But with our projections, um, they're going to be saving more between energy savings, demand savings, and asteroid income than what they're actually um, going to be that spending. Last thing? That's that solar renewable energy credit. It's called the ASREC. Um, when, when we secure the ASRECs for the district, they will be in a position where they'll be making money. Now, there will be a term, there will be a period of time in, in, the, in the model where um, they will not be making much because they have to pay off the debt for the installation costs. But between all the energy savings for the four projects, the SREC income and the demand savings, they're in a positive uh, for every year. Again, some years it may only be five to ten thousand dollars. Again, these are conservative numbers, so we would expect it to be more. But they're still making money or nothing else, they're breaking even. And ultimately, once it's paid off, that's when they'll start to see a windfall of, uh, of cash. Of savings, not, not, not additional income. Sure. It, it, well, it's both. It, it's no. both because they won't be paying. Once the payments are gone, yeah. then they move into the profit. Correct. Correct. Because they're saving. Saving so much compared to what they are spending now. Yeah, so it's just the savings, it's, it's not, not an increase in the income. Yes. You're not sending power back into the credit company, it's not paying for the powers. Well, we're not going over 100% because they have they have other buildings that we're not doing solar on. So district-wide, this is a district-wide project. Obviously, it's broken out for the villages, each village. But district-wide, they're not going over 100%. But for the buildings uh, that we're doing, we're, we're I think, I had a, about 65 to 70 percent of their utility bills goes away, so their utility spend is quite a bit. Right. So That's they, gone. So they have more money to spend on other things. More money to spend on other things. Demand savings dis changes, but then the SREC income, its actual income that the district will be will be making, um, and that is something that when you add it all together, they, they become very positive. It's front loaded, so the first few years are going to be really positive. Takes a dip, and then it's back front loaded again, and then by then the project is paid off, and it's just it's just money that the district will be will be earning. Okay. Uh, you had mentioned that the only thing going in the ground, if I understood correctly, would be the um, it would be pile driving the mounts. The conduit that the waterproof conduit is at an above ground, or is it? Oh, we'll be boring back to the building, so that'll be under. Is that direct burial? Uh, yes, I believe so. Other questions from the board? We'll yeah. have more chances as we go on, but go ahead, sir. Two quick questions. Uh, you mentioned a silk fence. I assume that's on the portion that's uh, contiguous or adjacent to the railroad tracks. Can I assume then that you're just putting that there temporarily to make sure that there's no yeah, let me uh, clarify that. The silk fence will be going adjacent to the wetland. We have an off-site wetland that's in this area here, and okay. we'll be putting that oh, along the disturbance yeah. along the boundary so, of the wetland. So I assume that when the project is completed, you take that silk fence down? Yes, sir. Now, can the site be seen from Route 120? We have uh, looked at that from the street. Nobody is ever going to see that when they're driving. If somebody was walking and they stopped and they looked in between a couple trees, maybe at the right time of year, okay. you might see it, but it is, it's, it's lost behind the building. Okay, and one other question. Uh, yes, sir. You mentioned that if it snows, you're gonna have somebody come out there and, and use a dust, dust it off, but is snow or rain or any precipitation going to affect the efficiency of the use of the equipment? Uh, uh, that's a great question. Um, the rain actually helps because that's what we use to naturally clean the panels because, you know, the dust or debris might get on there. Um, the, it's a coated glass, so uh, 
most everything's going to slide right off. At a ground mount level, we're going to have a much higher angle as well. So again, it's going to be hard for anything to stick. As long as the sun is out and those panels are heating up, the snow isn't going to catch. Where we're going to get in trouble would be a three or four foot, you know, one of the big Midwest snows, which we haven't had in a while, and we might get one. Then we want to make, yeah, exactly. We want to make sure then that um, somebody potentially, you know, once it's done snowing, we go out there and maybe room them off. The reason is, you're right, the production at that point would be very low. Um, that would affect, but we've taken, we've taken those projections already into our model. So before we even said we could produce this much, we've done that. You don't have the sheet, but this is the model. And there's a bell curve. You can see that it's uh, obviously in the winter months where we're lower, summer where we're much higher. Um, this projection doesn't work if it rains every day in the summer. But this is what historical weather in this area for the last 50, 60 years has told us, and that's what we put in. I assume where you're putting this is a grassy area to begin with, right? Is there any consideration that the grass is going to grow unless they mow it or weed whack it? The, the grass, uh, cover this stuff. vegetation should still grow, but it's going to be very slow. It shouldn't be uh, much of an issue. If they do make a, which is not recommended, I think it'd be easier for somebody to go out there with a weed whacker if it got really bad, but they do make a little robotic uh, grass cutting <laughs> under solar panels. Now that is used again more in the uh, in, in the West Coast where uh, where they have a lot more uh, sunny days. School district is going to stay ecological higher goals. <laughs> <laughs> Good idea. Thank you. Any other questions from the board at this moment? This is going to power the entire school. The, I mean, obviously with some exceptions, but like for the most part, it's going to be directly powering the school, or is it going to power batteries and then the batteries? Will no, uh, this case it will run directly back into the building and, and, uh, and power building. It's if something were to happen, the, the, the district will always have power between ComEd and solar. It, but if ComEd went out, they'd still be producing solar, so they'd still be going. But every eight seconds, it, it's milliseconds, and it, it, it flips back and forth, uh, multiple meters. Um, we're getting a little out of my pay grade. I'm not the engineer on the job, but. Uh, Basically, it's running back. It's converting the DC power, which is the power of the sun, into AC, which is what everybody uses uh, when you plug in uh, you know, your, your cell phone charger, your hair dryer, or whatever, your TV. Just, if most of the power goes to the Absolutely, and that's why solar is doing so well because the district itself uses way more of their uh, power in the uh, in the fall and in the winter months and, and stuff. <clears throat> the meter is going to spin backwards in the summer when they're producing the most, and it's also when they're consuming the least. So the meter is really going to pick up. You're going to get it. Correct. Remember, it's on a yearly basis, uh, and at the end, then when they need to start using it, that's when the meter start ca catches up. For the year, this building should produce what it needs. Now, in our projections, we have a one-time use uh, consumption. We don't need to reset. Chances are that number is going to continue to grow. So every year it may not produce 100%, but we know we're going to get very close to 100 at this building based on how much we can put in uh, in the ground mount. So you're getting a credit for that, but you don't have a battery that's storing it in its we, we, battery storage is not where uh, the technology needs to be yet, and the cost is very expensive. Okay. And they're not producing enough for what we want to do with battery anyways. Not to mention what I said before, Illinois lets you aggregate throughout the district. So if you think of it as a district project, this one building is producing 100 and I think it's 106% of their electrical cost, uh, your utility cost. But that extra 5, 6, 7% is going to go to offset another building. All right, stay close to Mike or take it with you. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Now we'll have a presentation of village testimony, which in this case, Mr. Burman, is you. All right, thank you very much, Mayor. Uh, just so everybody has a kind of frame of reference here, they had this plan that he handed out was they did uh, tell it to the C1, they did 12, 5, 17. Uh, the one that I actually generated this review letter was slightly different than they did uh, 
October 20, 2017. So this particular plan uh, they hand out today uh, does incorporate a lot of the comments of uh, one through eight from my review letter. Uh, specifically, the wetland is delineated on here. The high water elevation is uh, put on here. Uh, it's got the start to the erosion control plan with the silt fence. Uh, so these items were not on the previous version, but it's sort of uh, heading in the right direction. Here. Uh, I guess the core issue here is that with the Lake County Stormwater Management, any development over 5,000 square feet. Hey, I want to make sure the engineer hears this because sure. this, is, this might be for you. So. Yeah. Uh, I just mentioned that uh, we reviewed a previous version of the plan and uh, there's obviously more information on the plan being handed out today, which is a step in the right direction with regard to wetlands, uh, high water elevation, and uh, silt fencing. Uh, I guess the core with the uh, interpretation for the watershed development permit is that any development that over 5,000 square feet requires a stormwater permit. Uh, on this particular application, it's not going to be, we'll just say, like detention or anything like that. I would consider these panels, I mean, they, they're spaced properly and the water just kind of runs off and, and bursts into the grass below it. Uh, but it does kick in the uh, erosion control requirements and also the, because uh, we're adjacent to a wetland here, uh, as far as uh, buffer requirements. And what I'm asking for is that a delineation be done, which it looks like it was. Uh, it could be something simple with regard to like the air photo uh, determination. Uh, a lot of times a wetland consultant can look at the air photo and make a reasonable determination. And then I also want something that I can rely on with regard to allowable uses in the buffer something from your consultant that we can uh, make an interpretation, make, uh, and rely on uh, that interpretation of the ordinance. Greg, can you explain buffer zone for us, please? Yeah, where the wetland delineation is, that's where the, uh, the wetland type plants, or what's called like reed canary grass or sedge meadow plants are. So there's a definite demarcation where those plants exist and where they don't. And then the county ordinance actually specifies that it's not just where the wetland is, but uh, distance either 20 feet, 30 feet, and in some cases for heated wetlands up to 100 feet, where there's a buffer area where you want to basically uh, keep housing away from that, keep generally development away from that. In this particular case, you know, this is, uh, uh, what you say, unusual. You know, it's not a house, it's not a habitable, habitable structure. Uh, there's grass still underneath these things. If you look at the pictures, it's just the just the post. Uh, so we are going to have to. Uh, I want somebody from your team to look at the ordinance with regard to the buffer requirements and make a written determination that this thing is an allowable use of buffer. Uh, so the like I said, the Lake County ordinance says that 5,000 square feet is kind of kicks over the requirement for a permit. This thing, uh, like I said, I, my frame of reference when I first reviewed this plan was if you notice on Route 31, it's in McHenry County. I worked on that one. It's uh, the Shaw Center. They have solar panels. Uh, it's part of McHenry County College. And underneath that, they have the silt fence. They have the solar panels. But they, in their particular application, they would gravel and redevelop it uh, without any other information on the plan. Uh, you know, we just want you to clarify what you're doing. And it seems like you've done that tonight. And then also for what we do is that uh, you know, the, we're not the end goal, end uh, word on this. Uh, Haynesville is a certified community. We are the engineers for Haynesville. But we get on it. As a matter of fact, we actually today had to turn in our uh, self-certification and self-audit to Lake County Stormwater. And they will review it. They ask us how many permits we did, what type we did, and they will review our file every three to five years. And if somebody comes out here and complains and sees this and says, you should have required a permit, we didn't, uh, you know, those are items that we can lose our certification for. Uh, you might have some different opinion as to the 5,000 square feet, if we actually meet that or not. Looking at these pictures, you know, you have the single post, it looks like it's only you know, six square inches by the time you have each one of these panels. Uh, you know, I'd be willing to send the information we have, send it over to Kurt Wolfer, he's over there at Lake County SMC, and if he 
concurs that you know you really don't need a uh, stormwater management permit for this. You know, so be it. Uh, I've known Kurt for a number of years. I think he would agree that this would at least re will definitely require the uh, stormwater management permit, just the erosion control version. Uh, I can't imagine that the detention involved in this thing with the, uh, the ground cover maintaining it. So that's what we're, that's what I'm looking for in these eight comments. And you've got probably about half of them already started or completed, but it's just the permitting process uh, just needs to be followed. All right, here's a uh, take questions uh, from the board if there are any questions for Greg. And then Mr. Rock has an idea how we may be able to move forward. Questions from the board? A question about the vegetation. It sounded to me like you were planning to just leave the grass there and um, whatever happens, happens, but not put in any shade tolerant plants or anything. Is that acceptable, right? Uh, I'm going to have to rely on their past experience on this from the applicant. I mean, obviously the space between these panels. You know, I know there's some parts of my lawn that only get three hours of sun every day. I mean, I think it's probably analogous to that situation. So I would say it's acceptable. Thank you. Any All right. Okay. So, um, before we move forward, is there anyone in the audience that has a comment or a question? All right, thank you. Mr. Mayor, did, uh, is, is, do you want time to answer the buffer question now or is that for later? Please respond. Uh, again, as I said before, I don't want to get too technical uh, here with some, some of the language you know, in the order itself, but I, we're certainly would, would, would want to meet with you afterwards and identify with you, with you as a part of that determination of what are the requirements that the school district legally has to follow, and we certainly would follow those. Sure. Um, here's my suggestion, Mr. Rock, feel free to correct me if I, I go astray, that we proceed with this, with developing a recommendation here, and then in between this meeting and the next the two engineers, Mr. Rock, meet another room, work out the actual language for the approval of the special, or for the text amendment and the uh, special use permit, so that, that the caveats that Greg is concerned about will be covered, uh, yet we don't necessarily restrict, uh, we wait until we get the proper interpretation from the parties involved. Does that make sense? Can I just ask one question? Five bucks. <laughs> Put it on my bill. Okay. Um, did I understand you that you're only going to put a fence on the north side? You're not going to surround the whole thing. Whereas you surrounded the whole thing at the high schools. And as Jerry said, if the kids can find a way, they're going to find a way to get into it. Correct. We are putting what we believe is going to effectively be an impassable barrier. We are going to have a fence along the south side of the school, and then when we get down into the floodplain area, we're looking to put some sort of an impenetrable vegetative barrier. Uh, think prickly bushes, uh, things like that. So the only access would be coming off of the railroad side or the property east through the floodplain and wetland sort of area. We, we do not have any uh, school walkers. <coughs> Here, which is something that we've had an issue with uh, at other sites, and we have specifically wanted uh, full security fencing because of that. We don't want mischief going on. But given the age of the kids at the school, the fact that we do not have walkers coming through the area, that's why that's what we are uh, approaching as a minimum for security. And if we believe we need to uh, re readdress that at some point in the future, if you know, someone's getting back there and spray painting and tagging these things over there, we'll certainly revisit that time. Questions or comments? Go ahead. Even better. Yeah. 
uh, I'm not sure there's a need for a big meeting after this one to work out the language. I think what, the, what we're looking at, um, essentially, uh, it, and we're, in, we're talking about the special use permit, not the text amendment. The text amendment is pretty straightforward. The village board has, the, the, this commission and the village board has that language in the ordinance that they're reviewing. We've also, but in the, within that ordinance is also language for the special use and, um, I th and there are going to be conditions in that special use permit. I think we can do this pretty quickly. Um, if, it, if it turns out we can't, we can do it afterward. But um, the first one is, the first condition that we're, we're advising is that the solar energy system shall be constructed in accordance with the site plan attached as of today. That's the site plan you submitted as a, as a school district. The second one, we had language in here that said, prior to beginning work on the solar energy system, the petitioner shall comply with the comments and recommendations of village engineer Greg Rowan as stated in his letter to Mayor, Mayor Jared Daly, dated November 7, 2017. I think um, maybe what we want to do is just a wordsmith a little bit, is to say the petitioner shall satisfactorily address the comments and recommendations of village engineer Greg Rowan. Uh, so that we understand that maybe some of those have already been addressed in the, in the fact that you've submitted some additional information tonight, but that there are additional uh, concerns that haven't been addressed quite yet. So if, if that language is acceptable to everybody. Um, yeah, that's fine with me. That's fine, okay. And then the third would just be uh, that the, the permit is subject to um, full code review uh, of the construction documents by the um, the village building official. That that would essentially be the three conditions we recommend. If everybody's if everybody finds those acceptable, um, that'd be my recommendation. Do you need a minute to talk about it? I think we're okay. I think we're fine. Fine. Yeah. 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 Ye